I'm noticing that in a lot of social conversations, people are frequently using the word isolated. They are saying that they feel more isolated than ever before. As I listen, I empathize. I feel into what they're saying. And I put myself more into their shoes. And many times when I do that, I feel sad. What's interesting though is that when I name the sadness I feel, the conversation shifts. I find that when a feeling is named or owned, it provides a safer space for others to speak to something deeper inside them. They open up to their feelings more once they have confirmation that they know they'll be supported. In this special experience, I'm finding more people speak to their loneliness. They mention how things are so quiet in their homes, or when they talk to loved ones, it feels as if no one is listening. They long for a sense of closeness that is only provided by a special someone who completely understands them. I often wish their situations were different and that their loneliness was replaced with joy and connection. But I let those thoughts pass so I can be more present to the moment and meet someone in the grief that they're experiencing. What sometimes feels like I'm not doing enough gets reflected back to me as tremendous support and that people are actually are feeling safe enough to be their authentic selves. It surprises me every time this happens, but it also warms my heart, and I feel truly honored to support someone in this space. My wife and I talk a lot about emotions. I would argue sometimes too much. She would argue not enough. The other day she told me about the book she's audibling and how it has a lot of well-researched information about loneliness and its relationship to grief. I asked her if I could read her hard copy, and don't ask me why she has both an audible version and a hard copy of the book, and she said yes. So at the time of this recording, I'm halfway through Together by Dr. Vivek Murthy, and I'm really enjoying this book. It validates a lot of my personal philosophy and experiencing supporting people in grief. People not feeling loved or not feeling cared about. And people who are unable to find groups that share common interests, pursuits, or even values within a larger community. One of the things that really stood out from my reading is the downward spiral when people already feel lonely. As Dr. Murthy writes, We hide our true feelings even from those who may try to connect with us. Shame and fear thus conspire to turn loneliness into a self-perpetuating condition, triggering self-doubt, which in turn lowers self-esteem and discourages us from reaching out for help. Over time, this vicious cycle may convince us we don't matter to anyone and that we're unworthy of love, driving us ever inward and away from the very relationships we need most. This emotional spiral also contributes to the stigma that surrounds loneliness. Because people tend to hide and deny their loneliness, others who might help, including friends, family, and doctors, shy away from probing what seems like a sensitive emotional issue. Then the risk of self-destructive behaviors increases. Many people use drugs, alcohol, food, and sex to numb the emotional pain of loneliness. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear something like that, I hold my breath. Hearing something like that is scary, and it makes sense if it's perceived as a trap. It's almost like if you're lonely, you're doomed. But fortunately, once you feel loneliness, it doesn't have to stay that way. There are ways to ease it. Having healthy social connections and feeling cared about helps. It reduces the feelings of loneliness and helps us feel more seen, heard, known, and understood. That's where loneliness is a bit more challenging to people in grief. Losing a loved one can make a person feel very lonely. That sense of closeness is instantly taken away. All of a sudden there's a huge void. 
it came about way too fast. And it absolutely makes no sense. In trying to understand it all, some of the things that family or friends will say or do will actually feel hurtful despite their best of intentions. Grief and loneliness demand the world to slow down and hopefully allowing for empathy, love, and compassion to fill the space and help the healing process. But the reality is the world doesn't stop for our grieving. Hence, it becomes easier to isolate which further elicits the feeling of loneliness. In a recent grief support group, someone asked, is it normal to feel completely alone? The overwhelming answer was yes. But I focused more on the authenticity and the realness of where the question was being asked from. As I observed other responses, I took notice of how everyone felt alone. Even though there was other people around, it's so very common to feel misunderstood. And we all know how special it is to have someone who completely understands us. To further quote Dr. Murti, we all have a deep and abiding need to be seen for who we are as fully dimensional, complex, and vulnerable human beings. We all need to know that we matter and that we are loved. These are the deep-seated needs that secure relationships satisfy, and when they are met, we tend to live healthier, more productive, and more rewarding lives. When they go unmet, we suffer. We all have those special people in our lives that help us feel whole or complete. They mean everything to us. When they pass, the longing for them continues, and that causes pain. This is when many of us reach out for professional help. Some people work with a counselor. Some people join a bereavement support group. Some start a new hobby, activity, or project. These are healthy coping strategies that help us feel more supported. It sometimes fills a void when we need to feel more known, seen, and loved. As I share more about grief and loneliness here, I keep thinking of a widow I've supported for a few years. Shortly after her loss, she would tell me how lonely she felt and how certain friends would say things that would piss her off. She didn't have the immediate support she needed, and she has later acknowledged that she wasn't even quite sure what she would have needed in those earlier times of her grief. I remember our early conversations she would tell me the hardest times were at night, when everything seemed to feel like it was at a dead silence. When her husband was still alive, they had nightly Netflix parties. They would watch a program, discuss all the drama, make jokes about some of the characters, and make predictions about what would happen in future episodes. Evenings were a joyous time for them. The energy was playful, and the bond between them was strong. But all of that disappeared when he passed. And for quite a while, she would speak about how lonely her evenings felt. Even today, four years later, there's still loneliness for her. However, it's to a lesser degree. It's also something she's more familiar with. Since she has made lifestyle changes, and has added more pets to her household, and that all helps. She appreciates the unconditional love from her pets and thanks them for not judging her. She even hugs them when no other person is around. As she made space and invested energy into reconciling her loss, I reached out to her for advice to others who feel lonely in their grief. She had some amazing thoughts to share. Number one, have someone to talk to that has been through the same experience, not just a friend with a listening ear. It really helps to know that someone else has gone through something similar. Number two, never allow anyone else to run your grief. Do it on your own time and in your own way. Because this process can be difficult, 
Sometimes you may have to walk away from other people. Number three, know that you won't always feel the same way. As time goes on, you may still miss your loved one, but the grief changes and it makes it more manageable. Number four, be kind to yourself. If there is something you would do as a treat when you're feeling good, do it when you're feeling sad. And number five, find an environment with a lot of negative ions. Outdoors helps you to feel less suffocated and like your world isn't crushing you. The negative ions help you to feel like there are more possibilities for your future. If loneliness and grief are causing pain in your life, please trust that there are people and resources available to help support you. A lot of bereavement support groups are available online. My suggestion is to find one where the group members have experienced a loss that's similar to yours. For example, a widow support group or the loss of a child group. Also, know that I'm here to help. My work is about listening with compassion and empathy. I facilitate online bereavement support groups. If I can be of service to you, please reach out to me through my website, griefrefuge.com. And you know, I just have to tell you that Grief Refuge, it was created with the vision and purpose to help people in grief feel more safe to express their authentic selves. From my first idea about doing this work, I've wanted to build more community for people who are trenched in the loneliness of their grief. Even in these times of COVID-19 pandemic, there are ways to feel more supported. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Please subscribe to ensure you receive future episodes. Take care.